Hello and welcome to the 13th in my series of presentations on the conflict between science and creationism. Today I'm going to be talking about the subject of physics, the fundamental building blocks of all science and my own personal specialty. In particular, I'll be looking at a number of creationist claims made in the presentations of the infamous young earth creationist Kent Hovind. This means that I won't be covering the whole topic of physics, you'll be relieved to know, and I won't even be covering it in any sensible order. I'll just cover the topics that Hovind mentions. This presentation actually consists of only two topics. Most of the other aspects of physics that I want to cover are going to be touched on in the presentations to which they're relevant. But seeing as these were rather important topics, I thought I'd cover them in detail here. So though there are only two slides, I'll spend a while explaining each one in detail. So let's get started. The laws of thermodynamics were gradually uncovered by a range of scientists, mainly working in the 19th century, and formed the core of the science of thermodynamics, which is fundamental to a wide range of applications, from mechanics and astrophysics to chemical engineering. There are four laws in total, numbered 0, 1, 2 and 3, and they refer to properties which, as far as we know, are always true for specific theoretical physical systems. Of course, in real life, there are often extra complexities, which mean that the results don't precisely line up with the theoretically pure models. The four laws are precisely defined in terms of specific physical systems and mathematical models, but those precise definitions are often skipped over by con artists who want to hijack these laws for their own purposes. For example, those who are trying to sell perpetual motion machines. The most heavily abused law of all is the second law, which is actually one of the most difficult to define or to understand, but I'll have a go. The second law of thermodynamics is usually quoted in the words of 19th century German scientist Rudolf Clausius. No process is possible whose sole result is the transfer of heat from a body of lower temperature to a body of higher temperature. In other words, heat doesn't spontaneously flow from cold regions to hotter regions, but the other way around. This agrees with human experience, but putting the second law on a more solid theoretical footing allows us to be confident that this fact actually holds for all systems, not just those that our intuition can contemplate. The extension of this law leads to the concept of entropy, a word that creationists often throw around as if they understand it, then subsequently demonstrate that they don't. Entropy is a theoretical value calculated in various ways depending on the field, but generally relating to the number of possible states that a system can exist in. In more understandable terms, entropy represents the amount of energy in a system that is available for useful work. And the second law, when understood in relation to this definition, shows us that this quantity can never increase. It can only ever remain the same or decrease. But how does this all relate to evolution? Well, it relates via the common simplified understanding of the second law as stating that things cannot get complex over time. Of course, this isn't what the law says at all, at least not in that sense. The fact that entropy is related to order and disorder is true. There are far fewer ways of organising a quantity of molecules in an ordered pattern than there are of distributing them at random. So the ordered state has lower entropy. The second law tells us that in isolated systems, entropy never decreases and can only remain level or increase. So in a sense, what the second law says is that things always tend towards disorder. But there's an important caveat. The second law applies to closed, thermally isolated systems. That is, it applies only to systems in which no energy enters or leaves. And the Earth is most definitely not a closed system. It gains heat all the time from the sun and loses it to space through radiation. Hovind counters this argument by saying that adding energy to a system obviously doesn't create more order. He cites examples such as bombs and the decay of items under intense sunlight. But that's just an intuitive argument based on a misunderstanding of the science. What he's really essentially saying is that the second law disproves evolution, but that he wants to redefine the second law from a very precise theoretical constraint on theoretical physical systems to a very general hand-waving statement that happens to fit his own ends, and, moreover, is obviously false. You can't have things both ways. The second law says that a system must be isolated, and that in the case that energy enters the system, the entropy can indeed decrease, i.e. order can arise. Hoven denies this, but somehow wants to retain the second law in his arsenal in its modified form. Clearly he's playing some ridiculous double standards here. The bottom line is that by adding energy to a system you can produce order. The second law says nothing whatsoever about increasing disorder in every case, merely in isolated systems with no net energy transfer. If you want some specific examples, then how about the growth of plants and animals, or the growth of crystals, stalagmites and stalactites in geology? What about the formation of planets and stars from a chaotic primordial nebula? 
Surely the fact that, say, plants or bacteria can grow from a disordered soup of chemicals in a laboratory shows that systems can easily tend towards greater order and symmetry. Though in this case there is nothing problematic as the plants are not isolated. They're receiving a constant influx of energy from the sun and removing energy by radiation and evaporation all the time. To summarise, the second law of thermodynamics does not apply to evolution and anyone who attempts to claim that it does is either ignorant or deliberately trying to mislead. The constancy of atomic decay rates is an assumption underpinning some radiometric dating methods. We have many ways of measuring the decay rate and we understand very well the processes which cause unstable atoms to decay, which means that we can have a very high confidence that decay rates are extremely stable today and are likely to have been so in the past. But just how confident can we be and how much does that matter? Atomic decay happens when some unstable atomic nuclei spontaneously emit radioactive particles. The cause of this effect is a subatomic process known as quantum tunnelling, which can be understood by studying the strong molecular force that holds atoms together. Atomic decay rates are reliant on only a few simple constants, and those are believed to have been constant over extremely long timescales, probably for the entire history of the universe. In fact, the implication of these constants having changed much is so important that if they had changed, it would have been very easily measurable. Also, it's worth mentioning that creationists complain bitterly about how atomic decay rates may have changed considerably over the history of the universe, and then proudly state that the constants of the universe are so finely tuned that they're evidence for intelligent design. Again, they need to make up their minds. Either the constants of the universe are exquisitely tuned to specific values, to a microscopic degree of precision, or else they're free to vary hugely over time. Which one do they want? Because they can't have both. Incidentally, they need to have both or else their theory falls apart, but that's the least of their problems. So can atomic decay rates actually vary? Well, they certainly never have been observed to vary, except in a few pathological conditions. There are some atomic decay reactions that happen to be susceptible, for example, to specific chemical environments or intense magnetic fields. But there's only a few like this, and they only apply to specific decay types that we are aware of and can measure. Indeed, atomic processes are so dependable that the transition of electrons between energy levels in atoms is used to form the basis of photonic clocks, which are our most accurate timekeeping devices. The International System of Units, or SI, has defined the second as the duration of 9,192,631,770 cycles of radiation corresponding to the transition between two energy levels of the cesium-133 atom. Measurements of decay rates in controlled conditions, as well as measurements of astronomical events such as distant supernovae, demonstrate that decay rates have been extremely stable over large distances in time and space. In general, it's assumed, based on copious evidence, that decay rates are necessarily extremely stable and unaffected by external processes. Certainly they are not affected by the kinds of temperatures and pressures that can be found within the Earth, because we are able to simulate these scenarios in laboratories and check. Finally, what sort of discrepancy would we be looking for if we wanted to explain the old age of the Earth by saying that the decay rates had changed? Well, we'd need decay rates to have averaged, over the history of the Earth, roughly a million times higher than is currently observed, leaving aside the fact that we're not aware of any mechanism that could change the decay rates by any measurable quantity, let alone six orders of magnitude, there are other more clear-cut problems with this hypothesis. If the decay rate increases, then so does the energy released by nuclear fission reactions, such as those within the Earth's core. If decay rates changed by such a large amount, then the Earth would have completely cooked itself a long time ago. Please also see my earlier presentation on radiometric dating for more information on how this technique works and how it shows that the Earth is very old indeed. Well, that's all for now. As ever, there's loads more information on my website at frame.net, where you can also find a transcript of this talk and all the following ones and all the previous ones, and you can keep up to date with my blog, as well as learning about some of my other work. See you next time when I'll be talking about the science of genetics, a subject so important to understanding and demonstrating the truth of evolution that it can easily prop up the entire theory on its own. Thanks for listening.